Hello. Can hello. everyone hear me? Hello, 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 everyone. My name is Denasa. Hello, Denasa here with Action VFX. And welcome to VFX Hangouts. And today we are joined by an amazing guest, uh, Ryan Knowles from Electric Theater Collective. And Ryan is a Hi. VFX supervisor and 2D head of department at Electric Theater uh, Collective. And Ryan, I'll let you explain what you do. What is VFX supervising? What is 2D head of department? What is Electric Theater Collective? Yeah, great. Um, uh, a VFX supervisor is um, it's quite, quite a broad role. You know, a VFX supervisor can come from like a 2D compositing background or a kind of CG orientated background, but generally you're involved from the very beginning, like the, um, you start with a script, you break it down, you work out ways of shooting it, work with the director and the agency um, or client to solve creative uh, challenges, um, work out how to fix things technically, supervise the shoot, um, put a team together, sometimes run the job, most of the time do the job from beginning to end and then execute everything, yeah, managing the team. Nice. And um, what about 2D head of? Yeah, 2D head of department. So it's quite an old school name, 2D, because it's, it's a bit misleading these days. But definitely, <laughs> I mean, I kind of um, help maintain and run and develop, develop the compositing part of the company. Um, and that involves everything from bringing interns in and uh, training up juniors to making sure artists are, are satisfied with the work that they're doing, um, creatively challenged, um, but then also overseeing um, final execution, creatively reviewing uh, anything that goes out of the building, that kind of thing, and just making sure everyone's uh, happy and uh, satisfied, you know? Happy to nice. Nice. Yeah, yeah. And so you're working at Electric Theatre Collective and just let us know about Electric Theatre. Yeah, Electric Theatre is a fully independent visual effects company, which um, until recently, there weren't that many of them because, you know, they tend to get swallowed up. Um, but it's been independent for over 10 years. Started in Soho um, with uh, three founding partners. Um, and we're, we're in London. We've just moved to East London to a lovely uh, new studio. Nice big and open and suits our kind of um, more modern way of working. Uh, and it's just great because we ride that kind of line of being independent, uh, kind of nimble, but also executing award-winning, extremely high-end visual effects. Yeah. Awesome. And we're going to take a look at some of those like really cool high-end VFX. And so you're in London currently. Yes, You're I was London. going to do like a, a flashy VFX suite kind of <laughs> backdrop, uh, but the unions of like are on a rail strike, so everyone's at home. Um, <laughs> so this is this is where some of the magic happens. Um, yeah, you know we, um, we have a we have a a kind of um, a hybrid working practice. We do some work at home. And then uh, we do some work in the studio, like in a traditional VFX suite or, or open plan kind of communal area where we've got high quality monitors, HDR, 4K, and you can kind of get a little bit more into the detail and the actual finishing of shots. You know, um, nothing beats being together and collaborating. So we just kind of mix it up and it's, uh, it's working quite well. Yeah. All right. And... Um... So yeah, you're in London, I'm in Indonesia. So we're like cross continent live stream here, which is uh, super exciting. And we're going to take a look at some of the works uh, uh, from Electric Theater uh, Collective. So we're going to take a look at the video and then we're going to break it down. And if you have any questions to Ryan, just ask those questions uh, in the chat and Ryan would answer. So yeah, please do, so yeah. no, no, no no question is too simple <laughs> um so yeah ask away because uh, uh, I, I i've supervised the job from beginning to end so i've got uh, a wealth of knowledge yeah so the first thing we're going to take a look is the 
uh, what is it? The LG. LG. Yeah. Uh, LG, the the TV and electronics brand. This uh, this advert was directed by a great director called Sam Brown, and the the general idea is just that uh, light is the protagonist. So um, there's a there's a joyful there's a playfulness to the light, whether it be c CG sprites or um, or like a, a floating cube on a lake. Um, generally, the 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 light itself has a is like a drives the narrative. All right, so let's take a look at the video. So, wow, yeah, you really mentioned like the light is the protagonist and mm. yeah, like the light is very, like this very neon uh, light, like almost like a cyberpunk look, which I really yeah. love. So yeah, tell us a little bit more about like this project and what you're going to involve in this. In this so um, early on, we knew that there's the, the real in-camera interactive lighting is gold dust. So the question is, how can you get dynamic photography, like really good, interesting camera moves, um, and still maintain that kind of uh, interactive lighting on her and the environment that feels like it's moving how we expect the sprites to move or, you know. Um, so in that instance, uh, Sam Brown and um, uh, the production company this was shot in Ukraine. We had things like um, little light sources on fishing rods moving around the scene to try and like have cast light across her that lives. And even though it doesn't move exactly the same as how the sprite did eventually, the fact there's that kind of in-camera motion, it really sells it. Um, yeah. um, so just going through this breakdown it just shows the CG fish that we created for inside of the yeah. car huge amounts of rig removal, this cleanup oh. job and extra orbs inside the mirror room was a labor of love that took about five yeah, weeks. That's, yeah, that's something that I will ask. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so um, so this like this really neon uh, lighting look that uh, we, uh, you have in this is like, you know, it's everywhere, you know? mm. like, like that's the protagonist. So how does that, uh, you know, affect like the uh, VFX workflow? You know, like what are the challenges on doing like VFX compositing in like an environment like this where we have like really strong like lights in the player? Yeah. And stuff so, like that? Interestingly, uh, Alexa wide gamut is a wider gamut than ACES CG. So sometimes you have kind of rounding off issues with extreme saturation, whether it be pinks and blues. So there are there are fixes for that. They exist within Nuke, they exist within Flame. And it was just a, a matter of like selectively choosing when to use them and when not to use them. Um, Cause there is, there is a beauty in like an intense saturation. Sometimes you don't want it to be perfectly rolled off. Um, and I think that's just a, that's a new development that comes from embracing and working with uh, wide gamuts, you know? Um, yeah. And then beyond that, sometimes in compositing, it can be hard. You know, we naturally, we naturally in ACES workflow end up with quite nice rolled off highlights, you mm -hmm. know, because it's the, the RRT, DRT 
is doing that role off for us. And sometimes you just have to like really, really punch it up and go beyond what you think is a reasonable value. Sometimes beyond what the plate has in it, just to kind of get that punchness and crispness. So then when it gets into grade, they're not, they're not having to do all the work themselves. Yeah. Because. Um, yeah. You know, so like on, on the break. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> No, yeah. Uh, so on the breakdown, uh, like what we saw, like there's a lot of like relighting and like making things brighter or making things uh, darker. Um, so that's uh, something that was already on the plate. And so it's not like you like invented, like rebuilding the plate on post, you know, so you already yeah. have like all the informations that yeah. you need to make things brighter or darken things out. Well, I think, you know, for me, visual effects is always best when it's elevating incredible cinematography yeah you know? we love doing full cg sh full cg jobs um but you know there's a real it's a real art form to take incredible photography and elevate it and be true to it and respect the optics and i think yeah. that's something that you can never you can never stop learning about how to craft things optically i feel yeah yeah definitely you want to keep as much of what you shot like as much as of it as possible mm -hmm. in the final product and which speaking of that i'm actually a huge nerd on like plate cleanups <laughs> and uh paint I, I actually love that like uh to me i think like making like removing things is as fun as making things you know and yeah. and something that um that i saw in this uh uh, in this project is that uh, there's a lot of like rig removal, you know, like removing um, the like the, on the staircase, like removing the rig of the staircase and then removing like the like the door, like the walls. And then like you mentioned uh, with the mirror. So tell us a little bit more about that, because usually in like uh, doing a cleanup, uh, like the most general uh, like workflow is that you want to just take like a clean plate of it and then you just want to project it into like, you know, the plate that you're working on. But here we have like really bright lights and then reflections and you know those kind of stuff. So how did so how was that like? Yeah, you're, you're totally right. I mean, again, clean plates are gold dust, but to be a clean plate, something isn't there. Um, so you know when it comes to reflections on road surfaces that have had a wet down, then we tend to do like a, an inverted camera projection. So we would take the plane where something exists invert that below the ground plane and then shoot that through oh, the camera yeah. so you have a precise reflection of where it would be from the perspective of the camera and then it's all about working on how you break up that reflection whether it, and that's a combination of um sometimes you get mats for where the where the puddles are and you combine that with like accurate noise patterns of like the grit that's on the road but then also yeah. there's a there's a very precise amount of uh, there's a depth of field to that reflection as well, which needs yeah. to be paid attention to. And I I totally agree with you. I think we always say it, uh, my my co head Ian Murray and I we always say that accurate cleanup is like it is pure compositing because yeah. you're you're looking for precision. You're looking for making a um a le legitimate um complete photographic image while also applying incredible amounts of technical approaches and breaking things apart putting them back together breaking things apart putting them back together in the end it has to be seamless and invisible so um you're a you're a cleanup nerd but so are we yeah yeah, so now I'm going to take some uh, questions. Like we have several Ooh. questions for this. Like we have one for, from Randy. Oh, sorry. We have uh, one first from Hey Nice Thai. I hope, hopefully, I mentioned your name right. Uh, how much of the neon hallway was practical? That looked yeah. incredible. Lots of the neon hallway was practical. Um, you know, the, you, can, you can simulate that. You can create CG, CG neon lights. You can create the CG room, um, but 
if you have the, the money to do it practically, what you'll end up with is probably um, not only will you get happy accidents, but you'll also get something that's incredibly beautiful and art directed on the fly. Um, saying that, huge amounts of cleanup, you know, all of those, um, all of those neon lights were on wires attached to the ceiling and the walls, um, cleaning those up with a moving camera with really interesting glow and burn that comes from those kinds of lights, um, how, the, how that kind of parallaxes with the camera move. It's all very intricate cleanup. There's also, there's also a focus pool during that shot as well. So um, loads of attention to detail. So yeah, it was a combination. I think that shot was more about being true to the plate and making it perfect than, uh, than uh, relying on really, really high tech CG. Yeah, awesome. And we have another question, which is from Randy. How did you know how to expose the subject and did you test a lot as how as to how much you could push and pull the exposure from dark to light? So uh, on the shoot, you always have kind of a, a rough LUT that you're shooting with, whether it's like a default Rec 709 or whether you're viewing through like a slightly heightened LUT that kind of drops the exposure. When you're shooting through that, you kind of know what you're aiming for, but you also have a DIT who's kind of monitoring exposure so you know that your blacks aren't too crushed. The, the dynamic range of high-end uh, cameras like Alexa and Sony Venice um, is immense. So generally, and generally, you kind of know your blacks are safe so long as you're monitoring them and then... Um, there's probably a, there's always a limit to how how much detail can be in in the whites, especially if you've got intense lights. But um, really, a lot a lot of it comes from an amazing crew. You know, you've got a great cinematographer and uh, a good DIT monitoring what we're creating, what we're filming. Then you kind of know you've got the information there. Awesome. All right. So, if we have any more questions. Uh, one two point one gigawatt production ask no before footage we have the breakdown and actually we could uh, pull that up right now breakdown for the LG one moment <laughs> so um. Yeah, I mean, uh, this looks really good, and especially, and I, I forgot to mention about like the keying stuff because, like, at the end of the mm. shot, like you have, uh, like the hair, like waving around, and and you know, here in action VFX, people love keying. So, uh, yeah. So, how difficult was that? To you know, what's that interesting. Is? What's what's interesting about that is that when we when I like to do CG neon, I like to comp it duller than it's going to be in the end. And then I use kind of glows and blending modes to give it the heat. And because you're putting the heat through the glows rather than like the main base level comp, you get really good spill over the woman in terms of uh, like in screen space. Um, it tends to be the best way of doing it rather than rather than trying to just rely on like putting a, a hot thing behind uh, a pre pre multiplied element and then rel relying just on light wrap. You know, obviously you need some light wrap because that's beyond just the glow, but you know, that lended itself quite well to this approach. Um, uh, and, and like I say, we shot with, we had an idea, we had concept art of uh, what we were going to put in the background for the reverse of the city. So we kind of had an idea of like the quality of light that needs to be on her. Um, so then when it does come to put in, putting in CG elements, then you're, it's, you're not fighting the plates, you're just uh, elevating. Awesome. Um, All right. So if there's, is there anything else that you want to mention about this project? Maybe like, is there like a specific shot that was like really difficult that took a really long time? Um, I think, I think in terms of, uh, 
in terms of iterations, getting the, the final cityscape in the zone was tricky because you can have references, but you, um, you always have to create, you're generally creating something that never existed before. And for me, the most satisfying part of the job was, were, were the sprites because, you know, we used, we used um, lens flare elements, but we also used optical flares with kind of mu moving locators to create the perfect swing of the, um, the artifacts and the, and the optics of those lens flares in the camera. And I think that really sells the shots, you know, like a, a well-used lens flare that moves with the light sources can really make something that isn't there feel optical. Yeah. All right. So now we're going to move on to the next one, which is Meta. Let, Meta. Tell me a bit about uh, this one. Um, Meta is bonkers. Um, Meta was created in three weeks. Um, we thought that we were going to use a traditional approach where you kind of uh, use traditional animation or you use 3D animation and you do paint overs and that's projected, yada, yada, yada. We didn't have the time for that. So what we ended up doing was using GAN technology, which is a generate, generative adversarial network, which is basically a, a neural network that you can feed prompts into, you feed images into it and out comes something. And it was just a roller coaster of creating kind of chaos and creating images that we didn't know what they were going to look like and then trying to um, harness that chaos and bring it into something that's usable within like a, a moving image um, and, and an advert really. So that is a real, it was a real eye opener. It's our first use of AI uh, and uh, it was, uh, it was really exciting. Yeah. All right. So now let's take a look at the video. This is the dimension of imagination. Bonkers. Yep. A lot um, of really cool. Yeah. Puppets so we, uh, we, um, and painting. Yeah. Really, yeah. <laughs> so we, we, there was a shoot in LA um, uh, with the director was Thomas Huang, uh, who's based in New York, I think. And there was a shoot where they, they shot uh, puppets on green screen. They shot um, people on green screen and a, a little gallery set build. And then after the process of getting that edited together and getting a loose composition of where the puppets would, would live, then we had to create a CG jungle. So we prepped all the elements, like keyed them, despilled them. Then we started to lay layers of GAN uh, texture onto them where we kind of fed in images of fur, images of ice, just to create like a breakup on the puppets so they're not pure. And then for the background, it was a, uh, a CG constructed jungle that moved to the music and matched the, uh, matched the type of jungle that you'd find in a Henry Russo painting, which is the principal kind of imagery that we had to match. Um, and then we would feed this kind of basic CG jungle into the GAN and it would, uh, using a prompt that was make, make yeah. uh, like a Henry Russo painting was the prompt that we gave to the GAN. And it would, we would leave that iterating until we, it got to a point where it was looking like a Henry Russo painting, but it was just about to get too chaotic to use. 
because you're iterating on a single frame, just heading off on its own direction based on the prompt. And if you've got a sequence that creates a shot and you've got all of the frames iterating in different directions, then you just end up with this thing that's like chattering and pure chaos. So there was a payoff between how far can we make it become a Henry Russo painting before yeah. we have to stop it to bring it back together as a shot. Um, gotcha. Uh, so what was the reason on like using this AI like GAN instead of like maybe there's like a different way of using it like without using yeah. AI? There, uh, I we think even now it would be impossible to do this in any other way in three weeks um, because you know a conventional way of doing it, whether it being traditional illustration or paint over CGs, you're talking about months of work with a big team. And instead, we did this with probably like a core crew of eight people in three weeks. Um, and, you know, from the very beginning, Meta and the director um, really wanted us to embrace new technology and neural networks. AI, anything like that. EB Synth was a, is like an online style transfer tool that was one of the references. So it was part of the brief from the beginning, but in the end, uh, it, it really was the only way of doing it. <laughs> and you know, it has its own uh, has its own character, its own idiosyncrasies. Um, there's an imperfection to it that goes beyond tr traditional VFX and um, that's what we liked about it. And in the end, that's what uh, the guys at Drogue Fire, the agency and Meta loved about it, I think as well. Um, I think it also speaks to how like no one knows what the metaverse is going to be or look like. So really read a bit of a blank slate to go wild. Um, yeah. and, you know, I think this harks back to um, the effects when I first got into it, where, you know, I was inspired by music videos of like, the early 2000s where people were just trying things and seeing if they worked and maybe the results were imperfect but there was a an artistry to it and this felt like it was harking back to those days because sometimes the effects can be so precise that there's um there can be a reduction in kind of creative opportunities you know so yeah. opportunities like projects like this were uh, quite inspiring for us Awesome. Um, so, like, uh, I know that you kind of mentioned it uh, this before, but tell us a little bit more about like the process of using what was like the result of the GAN AI and how you incorporate that into like mm -hmm. the final comp. You know, like yeah, like is there like different passes that you produce using the AI and then like combine them together in uh, like in compositing? Totally. Like so then, you know. Normally, we'd rely on crypto maps to help us blend things together, but that doesn't go through the GAN. That doesn't go through the <laughs> So what we found was we'd have to do different, we'd, we'd have to take different iterations of the GAN output, some that are li a little bit more stable, but slightly less stylized for like a really detailed background. And for foreground elements, we would take further iterations. We'd, use, we'd create soft mats pre-GAN that would allow us to blend those two together. There'd be like one iteration of GAN like over the top of the puppets, as well as the, the fur and the ice textures for a different type of GAN that was image-based. So all of those things would be blended together. We had to tweak the colors before the GAN because if you made a orange to yellow, then that would turn into a banana in the GAN <laughs> or a grapefruit. So you had to like skew everything a little bit more red. So then when it came out the other side, it was still an orange. And it was more about that kind of um, experimentation ahead of time than it was about precision compositing after the fact. But you know, the thing that really saved our bacon was Neat Video um, uh, because you know, Neat Video has a, a temporal noise reduction yeah. that in normal, in normal VFX, you wouldn't crank to the max because there's an element of smearing. But in this instance, it was incredible because that that temporal noise reduction combined with the sharpening that it can give you when you when you crank that as well, um, it actually kind of uh, it elevated some of the style in a way, and that was really really good. 
that had its limits. Sometimes when that wouldn't work, we relied on Copycat in Nuke 13, which is a uh, machine learning where you kind of, you create a ground truth of, um, you use the GAN to create the imagery and then you feed that GAN into the Copycat as a ground truth and then feed the CG source in. And then that would give us a very, very stable, smooth version of the, um, of the jungle. But that version didn't have like, the chatter and the life. So that would be like soft blended or we'd use edge to text to use that to kind of make a stable edge or we'd use the pre-created depth map uh, that we would bring in some of the copycat background to make a shot more stable. Um, but really it was kind of, there are a few shots where with a couple of days to go, we didn't really know how to do them um, at all. Uh, but in the end, the, our kind of experimentation ahead of time uh, allowed us to pull it through. Um, yeah. yeah, amazing. Awesome. So uh, we're going to take some uh, questions uh, and comments from the chat. And the first one, Danasa, did you say creating CG passes of camera footage with AI? How to do that? Um, no, I was just uh, mentioning like if uh, somehow we could maybe tell the GAN like with a prompt, can you please make a pack, make some CG passes with <laughs> the result? Yeah, there's a really good video. There's a really good video of Copycat where they uh, they have like they have five rendered frames from a CG pass, a beauty, and then they just render the normals, which is cheap. And then they use the normals and those five frames or however, however frames they've got of uh, beauty pass in a copycat node to create a full sequence of beauty. So that's how you create CG passes with AI. But you should check that video out. It's called uh, Copycat in the Wild. And that we use that, um, we use that uh, as a little guide early doors. All right. And let's take another question. The next one, question. Being a Blender user, I found very easy to use C4D and Maya, but Unreal is a lot different from these. So what is an easy way to get photorealism in Unreal without diving deep and uh, wasting days? Mm. Um, it's a great well, um, Yeah, Brian, if you have like uh, some input about this, you know, like the workflow of getting photorealism. And I think like what really sells uh, something to be like photoreal is how the object kind of like interact with the environment, like the reflective the reflectivity. And if it's reflecting something and like some uh, like roughness and et cetera. Uh, yeah. And Ryan, if you want to add. Yeah, I mean, in any in any software, like the accuracy of the shaders and the lighting uh, and the textures in terms of their scale, you know, and how those textures break up, like um, where there's where there's wear and tear, where there's joins, all things like that. You know, the human eye is very good at analyzing those things. So in any software, yeah. that's the goal. But I, because I've come from a compositing background, I I, I don't feel like any CG software or game engine can create true photorealism uh, because I feel like there needs to be a layer of compositing to bring that photorealism. And that's, that's the, that is what compositing is. It's, yeah. it's ele elevating raw renders into something that feels optical. You know, yeah, there, there are, those, yeah. exactly. There are, but you can get great renders. You can get great, great renders that look almost photoreal. Yeah. But, for me, there always needs to be a bit of compositing. Yeah, there needs to be someone that puts the light, uh, the lens flare in there, you know, to really sell yeah, it. Yeah, so let's, <laughs> let's but, you know, um, you know, every photo realism is photography, and photography has uh, has nuances. It has like real aberration and uh, uh, like very specific bokeh, and you know, the nature of depth of field. And like I say, you can get really, really good renders, but um, I I think that extra two percent that makes uh, a real image probably comes from a little bit of compositing. Awesome. And we have one more question. Oh. 
So in this, from Randy, so in this, the render had to be the final edit because of time limitation? Um, yes, yeah, so to be honest, um, we had we had previous cameras. As, as the edit was evolving, we had previous cameras, and those cameras didn't really change. And we, we, we played with the layout of the jungle a little bit, but the renders of that jungle were so quick to render because we weren't using real textures. Like if we, if we tried to give them real textures, the GAN would just freak out because it was too much information. It just didn't work. So the CG renders that we used were actually created quite quickly, easy to iterate, and that was never the bottleneck of time. The bottleneck was how to take those CG renders and turn them into um, the stylized version of the jungle. Awesome. All right. So is there anything else that you want to talk about? Maybe like there's, again, maybe there's a specific, specific shot that <laughs> was just really difficult. Or, um, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I think I love the, I love the shots of the camera arcing around the kids looking up at the jungle with the snakes dropping in and bouncing. Oh yeah. Because it has it has uh, a stylization to their clothes that's that bridges the gap between the background and them. Their their skin and their faces are pretty clean and pure because uh, that was a direction from like uh, the agency and creatives. Um, but then the, the background is fully stylized and those CG snakes, they just fit in perfectly with the stylization of the background. And they have the same character as the plated, the, the photo, the, the, the real plated green screen, green puppets. And that all working together and sitting within the edit, I think it's just that that's probably my favorite shot. Um, I think the, the animators uh, uh, just absolutely smashed it. All right, so next we're going to look at the next video, which is Jaggermeister. And uh, yeah, I want to talk about a little bit about what that is. Yeah, uh, Jaggermeister uh, was, was an amazing project to work on because normally if you're going to like do a, like a stitch of many, many, many shots that just feels like one flowing camera, you'd probably rely on previs but previous tends to be very location specific. So when I landed in Kiev, we didn't have our locations. We went on a tech scout that we were gonna shoot the day after. So really we were finding a location, working out where best the angle is, and then we're working out how to get in and out of that location and stitch that with a shot that's before and the shot after. So <clears throat> it was a very creative shoot and we, we were just like spitballing ideas of where the camera could come out of or go into and how it all flows together. And I think when it flowed, when we got into the edit and then onto online and VFX and it start, started to flow, it was really satisfying. All right. Now, yeah. So now we're going to look at the video. Oh, I'm sorry. Awesome. All right. So, yeah, tell us a little bit more about how, what we just saw. Um, so, yeah, so um, no motion control. So those those huge moves were all techno crane. Um, 
like the shot coming out of the being at the music desk of the speaker and flying out through the room and out the window, turn around, look at the street, go down. That was probably constructed from uh, like 20 passes of different techno crane moves where huge people were just like shifting this techno crane around to create like a similar ish camera move. Um, it's a human, it's a human element. So it was hard to say which ones were stitched together, but we shot that over the course of like three hours to try and get the time difference of things turning off and turning on. Then into the car, that's a, a plate of the car. And then, then it goes into a stitches into a studio shot of a shot coming down. Then we're in the car and that's like a two and a half D constructed background. We fly back and then we, we stitch into a, a, a like a, little shot that like a little studio shot we did of a grill going towards a grill and then we go down into the cafe and because where we were shooting there wasn't enough room for a camera to go that high we go down into the cafe onto the tray of Jägermeister shots and then there's a stitch as we push up into the into the restaurant um the Jägermeister shots were shot in many many plates then we just animated those uh, in flame and then as we tilt up and fly into the fish tank. That's a full CG uh, fish tank with CG jellyfish. In through, the, uh, in through the ear, that's a new construction, two and a half D. Um, then out of there, there's a camera rig on the guy's head that we had to uh, clean out to get like the POV, his, his reflection in what is, appears to be a lift. And then we tilt up, we added lights onto the walls, push out, that big that big uh, bus is being held up by huge cranes and almost breaking oh so it's a real bus yeah the right hand side of that shot is all cranes that we had wow. to remove and use smoke elements and atmospherics and reflections to rebuild the plate uh and then cg uh cg jägermeister cg jägermeister glasses cg ice Wow. Yeah. So we don't have the uh, breakdown here, um, <laughs> yeah. uh, but I'm going to ask you a bunch of stuff about the shot. Like, for example, I know, like you you mentioned, uh, just just you just mentioned this, but like for shooting like something like this, where it's basically just like one continuous shot, right? So like, like I mean, like how difficult was it? Like, uh, how much planned? Like, do you have previous for this or? Do we do you just like maybe we could shoot uh, like three different ways and see which one works or uh, like mm. what was that like? I think normally for a job like this you would previous the whole thing, um, but like I say, a quick turnaround from pre-production to the shoot and not knowing where we were shooting meant that previous was uh, not as useful as it would be normally. So we only previous one shot, which is like the pull out of the window turn around and push down into the car. But, you know, that previous is based on a, a CG camera move. And this camera move is actually done by like a, I don't know, 40 foot techno crane uh, with someone operating the head and three men operating the base. So even if you have previous, it's only a guide. Um, and then in terms of the difficulty of shooting it, uh, it's hard to shoot options because you need things to stitch together. So really, you just need to match lens, camera height, speed of travel, in and out of shots, make sure you've got enough overlap and be checking speed of camera move. You know, there's lots of ramping that's in there, but you need to be kind of in the zone, especially when there's like human performance. All right. So like when doing like this type of uh, like this, you know, continuous shot, like how do you like organize and like assign like the comps to you know uh like to the artist like is there like a composer that works on one shot and then another composer that works on the transition of that shot or like like how do you like organize that yeah that's a great question i think you you split the tasks but, um by how simple you think the stitch is so if there's a if there's a really quite simple stitch on the grand scheme of things because none of them are simple but if there's a quite simple stitch then that's where you would divide it between two different compositors 
but really you want people to handle as much as possible um because there's a flow and you know it can be it can be heavy on the pipeline if people are just like shuffling things between each other especially when it comes to trying to get out a whip um to show the 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 stitch of everything um so really on a job like this you want really amazing artists jamming together um trying to trying to spread the workload as little as possible if you know what i mean because you want people to be working on as much of a stitch as possible because the it's say if you if you've got like 20 people working on piecemeal parts then it can be pretty tricky the one thing you can do is you can take a traditional approach or like a like a more long form approach where you're breaking things down into levels of task so you can have like junior artists working on cleanup and, and roto and then mid-level artists working on um base levels of comp and then senior artists that are doing the stitches and the blends we didn't have that luxury <laughs> we just had like five great artists jamming away i think awesome and um, so if we could go back to the uh, first shot, I really like the first shot with the like the balcony and then we're like zooming out and then we see the city and then the cities, we have like this day to night conversion. Like, are those like CG like city or no is that real and just no CG? No CG on that shot. It was um, wow. just coming out of the room was three camera moves because the room we were shooting in didn't have enough depth. So you had three passes of the room to get out. And then as you're out the window, you have a moment of respite where it's all in the same time of day. And then as it stops and turns around and the, the light changing and things turn on and off, that's when you start cycling through multiple passes of the same shot, like different, different, different takes basically. So in the end, we probably combined maybe maybe a dozen, maybe 20 different takes with different camera moves to create that uh, time-lapse effect. And also, all, each of those lights turning on is to the beat. Awesome. On, and on. also, oh, sorry? Sorry, I was just like pointing oh, okay. <laughs> out the, the lights turning on, yeah. Oh, yeah, no, it's okay. Um, so I also want to talk about like this part where, where we're looking into this guy's ear. So is that like a 3D projection of the guy or like how that, or is that like a real camera going really close to the ear? So yeah, so that's the, the, that's the end. Of, so we shot that scene in three camera moves. We had uh, a glass front to a fish tank with black on it. So we would, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. We had one camera move coming down onto the tray and then tilting up in a different location. Then we had another camera move, which is coming down and tilting up in the actual location because the first part had a higher ceiling. And then that first part pushes into a piece, a curved piece of glass that's black fronted. So then you get the reflections of the room. Um, and then you have another pass without that black fish tank front that does the mm -hmm. whole move, goes through, and then does a turn to the guy's head. And then I think we did a stitch just as it got close to his head, so we could go closer in. Then as we got really close, we did a blend to stills because we could get uh, closer still. And at that point, it becomes like a, a nuke 3D, or 3D space projection of like tunnels with kind of sinewy synapses that we kind of animate through and then come out the other side with uh, some kind of aberrated uh, focus pull. Awesome. I also, like I mentioned, I really love the bus, like the floating bus. I really thought that was CG, you know? Yeah. But you because... actually lifted up <laughs> a real bus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Both, are, both are good feats in their own way, but the, the, the beauty of shooting in some locations is that they can pull certain things off and it it did look like the bus was going to break to pieces any minute but um <laughs> you know i think we did a pretty good job of um of cleaning out like you know one half of that frame was an absolute mess um mm -hmm. but, but it, i think it worked out in the end 
Yeah, but and but like the light uh, flickering on the bus, those are like in calm. Yeah, or uh, yeah, the interactive. We had we had light sources. We had the lights on the bus turn on and off to get interactive lighting on the girl, but the like in LG and in Jägermeister, we paid really close attention to volumetrics and light sources and the noise in those volumetrics and uh, kind of using the the in-camera interactive lighting as a jump off point. Awesome. So let's take a look at the comments. I mean, the chat, if anyone has anything. Um, well, first we have from uh, Kartiki Srivastava, he's asking, Ryan, sir, please give some hacks for compositing that professionally used to make the composite uh, real and hide minor mistakes. And that helped to save time during rendering elements. So I think uh, like some cheats during like compositing uh, that, you know, could reduce like render time, maybe like, so we don't have to render too much on the 3D side. So mm -hmm. like we can, you know, like do that in comp. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, hacks is probably like, it's kind of like considerations. You know, if you know that you're dealing with a shot that's got shallow depth of field, don't wait to the last minute to apply that depth of field, whether it through, whether you're applying it through like deep renders and PG Boker in Nuke or some other tool, have a look at that early doors so you know what you can see because you might be wasting time on a CG render of something that isn't really seen when mm -hmm. when when the optics are applied. Um, uh, I'd also say like people can end up spinning wheels and wasting time using subjectivity to create an, a look when really you mm -hmm. should be looking for references, whether that be films, photography, music videos, art. Uh, if you find references, then you can use that as like a pivot point and make judgment calls quicker than if you're just relying on your brain. Awesome. And then we have another question from Stephen Edwards. From the time you ingested uh, the footage till delivery, how long did this project take? Did you have to work a lot of OT to finish? Mm -hmm. Um, I think from ingest to finish was six weeks. Um, and we did do quite long days. Um, not many, I don't think we did many week, not much weekend work, but we did quite long days. I think because, you know, sometimes you, when you're all together, you get in a flow and you just want to like polish, 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 polish. Um, but you know, that can be driven by us. You know, if you're, sometimes your passion takes over and it means you you put in a few extra hours here and there because you think it will benefit in the end. But I think the goal is to create great work without having to work beyond your regular hours. And yeah, that is possible. Yeah, uh, believe it or not, there's actually a life outside of VFX. Who knew? <laughs> Do you know about that? <laughs> Yeah, totally. You know, I've, I've got I've got a family. I've got two kids. Yeah. Um, you know, it's all about balance, isn't it? VF, yeah. If you if you kill yourself with VFX, not literally, but you know, if you yeah. work too hard and you don't have a balanced life, you can lose your passion. You can use your yeah. um, objectivity. I think you need to stay inspired, and you need to do other things, and yeah. that that takes time. Yeah, Go you don't want to like time. Yeah. So you don't want to like, you know, burn yourself and you don't want your passion to turn something that, you know, you, you dread, you know? Yeah, definitely. If you yeah. can make, if you can make a career from something you love and it doesn't have any um, detrimental effects on you, which, you know, working too hard can take a toll, um, then I think that's a, a good life, you know? Yeah. All right. So this is, this is a philosophical talk about visual effects. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, like we're VFX artists, so it's kind yeah, of yeah, you know, totally, totally. we're on, we're still on that you know on that circle. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, and the next thing we're going to look at is uh, the uh, Pharrell music video, the Cash In Cash Out. Mm -hmm. 
and mm -hmm. we're going to play it uh, on the side uh, while we're talking about it. So here we go. So and this, yeah, and we're going to mute this because like of the music and we don't want to get like copyright strike or <laughs> something. And like it that. is the lyrics are naughty. Um, yeah. <laughs> Full CG music video, over three minutes long. Full CG zoetrope. Um, yeah. The zoetrope is actually spinning. So we created animation loops of characters and put those poses on an actual spinning zoetrope and worked out exactly where they need to be distanced. So as the zoetrope spins with the refresh rate of the, ca the CG camera, the animation loops. Um, everything is being done for real, but virtually. Uh, the only thing that you can't loop on a Zoetrope is the lip sync. So the lips aren't on a loop because they're singing along, but the performance yeah. is actually spinning on a Zoetrope. So like this Zoetrope, so there, so when you guys like rendered the 3D, you're actually rendering it as a Zoetrope or like yeah, so when you're just first... making it look like a Zoetrope? No, no, it is a CG zoetrope. So when we first started, we created the poses, put them, put them on a spinning platter, and then just filmed it and worked out how fast this platter has to spin for it just to, for the, for the, the optical illusion of how a zoetrope works is recreated virtually. So, and then when we did that, we looked at how, whether we want to have like imperfections of like where the registration of those poses are as it spins. So we had ones where like they were, they were more jittery because they were imperfectly positioned. But then we decided that the, the registration of where they are shouldn't be the imperfections. The imperfection should be maybe in like whether you can see a thumbprint in the models so it feels more kind of uh, claymation or like mm -hmm. uh, a figurine. Um, and then we just, we made that choice early on. And then, you know, it's just an, it was just, it's all about uh, working with the director, um, uh, Francois Rousselet, um, and working out how to kind of take his amazing ideas of the, the tableaus and the animation loops and working them into the shots. Um, lighting plays a huge part in this uh, music video because, you know, it's immense. It really gives a sense yeah. of atmosphere, uh, really modern. I think, uh, yeah, it plays a lot. You know, there's Easter eggs everywhere. Yeah, like a lot of stuff to look at. <laughs> yeah. So something that I want to ask about like this project, like you mentioned, this is like a fully like animated. So there's no like live action plate in this at all. No live so action it's all plate. animated. Yeah. And yeah. this is connected to like the previous uh, question that uh, we had, which is um, usually when we talk about compositing, we're talking about like, adding like CG stuff to a live action plate or, mm -hmm. you know, like manipulating a live action plate. So what is the role of like a compositor on a fully CG uh, production <clears throat> like this? Yeah, that's a really good question. You know, um, rendering in camera uh, defocus straight out of CG can be incredibly expensive. And, you know, nowadays with deep renders and PG Boker, you can get really great compositing based <clears throat> uh, defocus uh, depth of field, controlling that in comp and just, you know, depth of field is relative to the size of the object and the distance of the camera and the lens that you're using and the, the f-stop. So, but having like a little bit of creative freedom within that realm um, mean in comp means you can kind of fine tune things, test things out. Um, so the role of compositing in a full CG job is about um, balance, um, you bringing in atmospherics, which tend to be rendered mm -hmm. as a separate parts that can't be used in a, a deep workflow, um, applying depth of field, and then playing with optics like chromatic aberration and other kind of uh, little lens effects, such as glow, blur, softening, that kind of thing. Gotcha. So um, and also, this is also another question for me, which is, um, with like you doing like a fully uh, CG like this, especially with like the compositing tools that we have right now, like for example, Nuke, 
uh, we have uh, like Nuke has a very sophisticated like 3D you know tools inside of it. Hmm. You know, so uh, where like where is like the good balance to like how much do should we like? I know that you mentioned about like doing the atmosphere and like doing extra bokeh and stuff like that in comp. But for something like uh, this, is it possible to maybe just uh, rendered out, uh, like maybe just uh, export the model and then do the lighting and like compositing? Like, is that something that is <clears throat> achievable? Yeah. I mean, I guess you do have um, you do have ray tracing renderers inside Nuke now. Um, for me, you know, something that's really really high end uh, is about artistry. Um, so for this, it's rendered in Arnold, and um, and I don't. I think it all comes down to like who's using it. You know, yeah. you yeah. can get you can get renders inside Nuke, but if you're looking for really really high end visual effects, then you probably want to do the lighting and rendering in a CG package. Um, yeah. And then inside Nuke, you can always you can always use like normal passes and push the CG around and work out if you need a bit more light source. And, you know, in the AOVs, you'd always get the, the, the shaders, but as well the light sources. So you can like rebuild the CG using lights so you can play with the contribution of all of those things. But even when you do that, sometimes you want to feed that back to CG to get like an update of the CG. So then you're doing less of that in comp. So it's more mm -hmm. kind of like a creative feedback loop. That's for me. That's the best way of working, um, uh, and you know the same goes for kind of Unreal. You know you can yeah. you can you can have like an Unreal setup done within Unreal, and then get the bridge into Nuke, and like you can access a lot of the work or a lot of the setup. But really, you don't. For me, in compositing, it's about like iterations trying things looking for perfection like analyzing and you don't want your comp to get too heavy awesome uh so we're going to uh take some questions and so the first question is let's see we have from dave mcclough sorry <laughs> dave mcclaughlin and which is uh, hi from Scotland. I love yeah, um, Scotland. Yeah, which is I believe it's close to where you are. <laughs> At yeah, least in the same on, continent. On a global scale. <laughs> yeah, sure. On a global scale, it's closer to Scotland it's from your place island. than my yeah. place. Yeah, yeah. And hi from Scotland. I love movies in three D. Did that prove a challenge for compositors? Um, I think so. I think it asks something different of compositors because, you know really true compositing is about accuracy and light and shade and um, photographic precision. Um, so really that is lighting. So with a 3D project, you tend to get pushed more towards uh, feedback loop with lighters. Um, and in the same way, lighters, you know, we always want our lighters and effects artists to be kind of comping their work as well so it's not just like a handover here's the passes work it out yourself you know um so i think i think the beauty of like full cg movies and and adverts and music videos is that the the discipline and the demands are slightly different um it's a real interesting muscle to flex Awesome. And then we also have another question from uh, Kill Boyd. Uh, tell us about uh, the hardware used for rendering VFX. Uh, hardware used for rendering VFX, yeah. So um, so we use uh, Arnold for most of our rendering, uh, but we also use uh, some Mantra as well. Um, it's all like a horses for courses. We do have part of our render farm that can handle Redshift, which is uh, great as well. We're starting to look at real-time renderers um, or near real-time renderers. Um, we're also looking at using USD approaches. So then we can bring in kind of um, uh, like game engine generated assets. Um, so 
So predominantly Arnold, but we use we use anything we any tool we can like bring in and make work within our bespoke pipeline, which is kind of anything really, because we built it ourselves, the pipeline. Um, anything that works for the project. Yeah, definitely. All right. Awesome. So yeah, those are some like really, really awesome stuff, you know, like really high end, really just, like, I want to make stuff like that. You know? <laughs> and like, again, I mentioned this multiple times, but I really love like the shot of the bus, mm -hmm. you know, like floating. Like I really love like the composition, like the color, yeah. you know, it's just so beautiful. I love it so much. Yeah. And the goal, the goal is always to kind of, create relationships with like great artists, directors, mm -hmm. cinematographers, uh, mm -hmm. creative directors. So when these really interesting projects come around and you, you can imagine the, the kind of imagery that might come out of it, mm. that's, that's what makes VFX exciting. You know, like there are many different projects, but when you're working on really striking images, then it makes VFX even more fun, I think. Yep. And also, like uh, a lot of our viewers are people who are just like starting on like VFX or like learning VFX. And as a pro, like as someone who has been working on this industry and makes a bunch of really, really cool stuff, like do you have any advice on like <clears throat> how to do the things that you do? Yeah, I mean, um, from a from a compositing perspective, there are. You can get software for free if you're learning. You can get Nuke for free if you're learning. You can get Flame for free if you're learning. And with those softwares nowadays, YouTube is an amazing place for kind of tutorials and knowledge. Um, I would say like always download the media so you're not just watching tutorials. You're actually doing it mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. uh, that's the way to that's the way to learn. But you know. I think experiment, you know, if there's, if you've got like a Blu-ray of something, like why not kind of, um, why not grab it, camera track it, pop something <laughs> into the scene, see if you can comp within it, you know, because yep. every shot is different. And, you know, um, the human, yeah, the human eye is so good at seeing bad tracking. Like if something doesn't track to a scene, humans just like, zero in on it instantly so for me from a compositing perspective if you can get like if you can work independently of like match move and like do quick camera tracks put things in the scene on cards you know work within the camera then i think you're probably standing yourself in good stead for like a career in vfx and if you demonstrate that with a with a reel and you show people you can you can put things into scenes and it feel true then uh, people will notice. Yeah, and especially like uh, like I mentioned about like ripping like a scene from Blu-ray, like people do a lot of that on YouTube. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like yeah. people do a lot of like really funny stuff, just tracking like something else or like not a character's face or stuff like that. And yeah, like I agree with you. Just you know, just start and do it, and just don't be afraid to just uh, like your first uh, work is not going to be the best one. You know, yeah, so yeah. just don't be don't be afraid to like yeah. fail basically. and it will take it will take a long time as well because <laughs> because yeah yes. <laughs> first thing i worked on i i didn't know i didn't know like handy little shortcuts i didn't know how to optimize what i was doing um so i was doing i was working really hard like in the middle of the night to try and make something work and you know with experience and the right tutorials you can save time and work smarter um not all not all VFX has to be time heavy. It can just be like good ideas executed well with precision. Yeah. And like, if you want to know how, like to practice on the Action VFX YouTube channel, we have tutorials and there are the a lot of the tutorials where we also share like the plates that you can download and yeah. So, and speaking of, oops, sorry, <laughs> just knocked on my, uh, uh, not my desk there. 
And yeah, speaking of like action VFX, uh, we already uh, have uh, the winner for the giveaway that we conducted at the beginning of this live stream. And we will be contacting the winner of the giveaway shortly via email. And if you receive that email, please let us know in the chat so we know who you are. And congrats on getting all the giveaway stuff because uh, you have you will get a lot of really cool assets from us. And there are three winners. So all three of you, sure, show yourself and let us know what kind of cool stuff that you will be making with all the giveaways. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we ETC have just purchased like a lot of action um, VFX's database, and you know, as a as a compositor, being able to take 4K pre-multiplied elements and just try them out and not not waste time on an element that won't work um, is invaluable because you you know. You can do a lot in CG, but you know having elements that give you atmosphere and give you kind of yeah. uh, epic effects quickly, magic. And you also learn how to use them subtly. You know, like I was talking about earlier, volume volumetrics. You know, you can create a nice volume light just from a roto shape and a really good mm -hmm. smoke element. You know, it's as simple mm -hmm. as that. Yeah, yeah, and and yeah, so. That was really great. <laughs> that was really great. And uh, yeah, again, uh, like I mentioned, uh, tutorial. And uh, so check out on our YouTube tutorials because we have a lot of like really cool stuff, uh, like Ryan mentioned. And it's very easy because our, like, our elements are like really high quality 4K and like pre multiplied. And then basically just really quick uh, drag and drop into like you know, compositing. And it's already looking really great. And then also uh, next week we'll be releasing new collections, and basically just to give you a bit of a teaser, if you want to be the god of thunder, this new collection that we are releasing um, uh, next week would maybe help you be the god of thunder. <laughs> so who yeah, doesn't, be who on... doesn't want to be the god of thunder? Is the question. Sorry? <laughs> Who doesn't want to be the God of Thunder? No. Oh, yeah. Everyone wants to be the yeah, God no. of Thunder. And if you want to be the God of other elements, like fires, we also have fire elements. If you want to be God of like rain, we also have rain elements. So we have a lot of stuff here at Action VFX that could help you be who you really are. That's our new slogan. No. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, Ryan, uh, do you have anything that you want to plug, maybe talk about? something that you're working on if you could share um, yeah everything we're working on is top secret so i'd have to kill everyone but you know um vfx is a great industry to work in and mo in modern times we we have artists that work from all around the world um brazil to to east asia um everywhere australia so if you're interested in a career in vfx and you've got some interesting tests that you've done then drop us a line via uh linkedin or via our website electrictheater.tv yeah and tell them that ryan sent you yeah and yeah you know, <laughs> ryan and Danasa. Get, get in touch yeah <laughs> all right um ryan thank you so much for sharing with us your vfx wisdom and like your really cool really, really cool stuff and to all the all of our like audience who are watching thank you so much for sticking with us asking a bunch of really cool questions because this is like this live stream is just something that is really you know useful because here in action vfx we want to help you guys um not just how to click buttons on or how to like do vfx but also like you know just the industry in general like what the industry is like what the workflow is like we just we want to make uh the industry like the uh, vfx community uh, to be better. And yeah, thank you so much for sticking with us. And this is the NASA and see you next time. Bye-bye. See you later. Bye.